Good morning. This is Bill from Out of Europe in Naples, and I'm here in this echoey room uh, in our new location in the new uh, photo booth to bring you this 1989 Jaguar XJS Coupe. Uh, 89 was a very special year for me, the year I graduated from high school. So uh, this car would have been pretty special uh, back then when I was just a, you know, dippy 18-year-old kid looking for something cool. Uh, I'd have been very happy to have this Jaguar instead of the crappy old Firebird I did have. But uh, anyway, time flies and here it is many, many years later. And now I do have this Jaguar, although it's not quite as exciting as it would have been back in the day. Uh, anyway, we're here in the photo booth. It's a little bit of a strange thing for me. I'm trying to get used to it. I'm not sure of the lighting. I'm not sure of the sound. Uh, you know, the car looks pretty strange to me through the viewfinder. Uh, I will say this, it is air conditioned. I do have this mini split going wide open over here, so that is a nice uh, change. But the fluorescent lighting kind of sucks, makes the car look a little bit strange. And that's a shame because this is one of the finest examples of an XJS Coupe that I have seen in a long time, certainly since they were new. Uh, you can see the famed flying buttresses back there. They were very controversial. Uh, in fact, those flying buttresses were a holdover from uh, the car when it was being designed to possibly have a mid-engined uh, layout. So uh, that was up there to make the back a little bit more strengthened. Uh, they went to a front engine design and kept the buttresses because, frankly, they're just pretty friggin' cool. So uh, anyway, what a neat car. You know, very, very controversial from the start. Uh, Jaguar seems to keep its models for a long time. It's not necessarily because they're good. It's usually because they can't afford to make new ones. And that probably held true for this car. Uh, came from the heyday of the British Leyland fiasco stuff in the uh, 1970s. Uh, in fact, the car was released for the first time in 1975 and ran all the way through 1996. So a 21-year model run. Uh, it replaced, again, the E-Type, uh, what Enzo Ferrari called one of the most beautiful designs, uh, if not the most beautiful design that he had ever seen. I mean, imagine that compliment from Enzo Ferrari on a Jaguar. And here along comes this grand touring thing, not offered as a convertible, uh, that's meant to replace it. So, of course, a lot of people went uh, bananas and they just didn't like it at all. But uh, it's probably one of the most successful, unsuccessful cars of all time. And the fact that it ran for, you know, again, 21 years of production, uh, sold, I want to say, 115,000 units, which is pretty good for a, you know, 12-cylinder powered, you know, grand touring car. And, uh, you know, is sort of an iconic vehicle that you still see around today and that has a pretty dedicated following by, you know, masochists and other people who get into self-abuse, uh, you know, the thought of owning one of these, it's about as far as you can take it, particularly the 12, oh, I'm kidding, they're not that bad, they're, they're not that bad. Uh, anyway, you can see by 89, uh, this one had the cross lace uh, wheels, lovely in chrome, very, very attractive, lovely chrome bits around the windows, although they did go with black trim on the side, so they uh, maybe updated that. Uh, you can see the lovely chrome door handles, and again, such a distinct shape, really unlike anything else, and that beautiful chrome around the bumper. All right, let's start inside the trunk, and this thing has a very, very ample trunk. Uh, you can see you're going to be able to fit a lot of stuff in there, no problem. Uh, you've got uh, your, you know, battery box there, and you know, nicely tucked away, full-size spare tire, uh, very lovely with the black cover. All very proper. You got some space over there on the sides. You got your toolkit over there on that side, and uh, everything looking and acting very properly as it should. Just just a lovely area on the car. Uh, so yeah, there it is. Anyway, trunk all looking good. Love the V12 bed. Let's get into the V12. Oh, this echo is fantastic. I feel like I'm in the Alps. Nice solid thud when you close the door. The car's a pretty good build quality. Okay, now in here, in this mess of vacuum hoses and wires and tubes and, uh, you know, all of the uh, sort of uh, under hood accessories, is a 5.3 liter V12 engine. And you really have to give, uh, give a nod to the guys at JAG to, to take this engine, which sort of originated in the E-Type 
carry it over into this car and go with it for so many years. There's just nothing in the world as smooth and lovely as a 12 cylinder. And of course it's a dying breed. We're not, you're just not gonna see many of them in the future. You really didn't see that many of them in the past. Uh, you know, by this time in 89, it had become the HE V12, and that's uh, for high efficiency. Uh, it's a little bit like saying, you know, you're doing some accurate detail work with the sledgehammer. Uh, what they essentially did was change the tuning, the programming, the injection, uh, the rear end gear, a few other bits and pieces to get it up over 20 on the highway. So it became, you know, a fairly fuel efficient car. Uh, now this thing does have 38,000 miles. It's been, uh, you know, owned and garaged, uh, you know, not quite locally, so actually it started in Denver of all places, but has been very well cared for since the beginning. And that's obvious. You can see in the way everything is under here. It's all original, the paint's original. Everything's just lovely on the car. Uh, the motor runs like a Swiss watch for want of a better word. You see it's got the AC compressor kind of buried there in the middle. And, uh, you know, despite it being one of the most convoluted and strange uh, mechanical contrivances in world history, the thing does run great. Stuff like this, you know, finely tuned aluminum oil cap, it's just all very cool and all very Jaguar, all very Coventry. Uh, this car was one of the last ones that uh, had the fingerprints of uh, Sir Lyons on it, the originator of Jaguar. He died, uh, I think, a couple years before it came out, but he was involved in the... Uh, in the design and the planning and you know that alone should make it uh, a bit more collectible than it really is today. So they still do represent something of a bargain in the collectability world. So uh, you can see what I've done here is I've lowered the hood to where the uh, uh, safety release is under where it should be. It's still up a little bit. Uh, you know some guys who are uninitiated in these things are going to be slamming on that trying to get it to close. Don't be tempted. Open the door. The hood lever down here, give it a pull, sucks down the hood, and that's the proper way to do it. Okay, inside, all original, beautiful uh, leather. Absolutely gorgeous. The, uh, oh, I can't remember what they call those hides, but they're just fantastic. There's nothing else that smells like them. Absolutely lovely leather steering wheel. Uh, 89 is uh, the days before airbags, so you have a nice thin wheel. I remember when the airbags came out, you know, everybody was gung-ho and loved the airbag thing, but it did do away with the sort of lovely uh, steering wheels, particularly when airbags were these giant, like shaped like a loaf of Wonder Bread in the middle of your steering wheel. It was just ridiculous, so uh, there was a certain joy to uh, having a uh, airbagless wheel. Uh, now it did uh, need to have either an airbag or a safety restraint, a self-locking seatbelt mechanism in 89. So uh, it put these guys on sliders. What you would do is connect, uh, I don't know where the hell it is. I don't think it's this thing. I don't know, somewhere else. Anyway, you connect it into this guy here. Oh yeah, the, uh, the lap belt over here. Let's see if I can find it. No, it's all been smushed down beside the seat. Okay, the hell with it. Anyway, you would clip that into this guy. When you get in the car, turn it on. That slides to the back and puts the seat belt on you. So uh, that is the government thinking you're not bright enough to put on your own seat belt and they're goddamn well going to do it for you. Uh, now the car was lavished with lovely wood and leather everywhere. You can see the burl wood and the door panels, all the chrome switches, all sort of hearkening to a different time. Uh, and uh, you know this was a fairly expensive car uh, by the time 89 rolled around. It's competing with things like the Porsche 928. Uh, it was originally built to compete with the Mercedes-Benz 450 SLC. If you remember that crazy looking car. Uh, Jaguar just thought that Grand Touring Coupes were going to be the future and uh, a bunch of them were coming out of Germany, the 6 Series, you know, the 633, 635. So uh, they tagged along and, you know, built a, a pretty cool competitor to those. Uh, you can see the beautiful chrome uh, entry panel there, just absolutely lovely. Before we get in the car and drive it, I'm going to go over here to show you the documentation that came with it. So. Forgive my little goofy desk. Uh, anyway, so you can see that this thing is about as well documented as any car that I've ever sold, particularly from 89. All the original books, very, very nice. We've got the original window sticker, glasses on. What did this thing cost? 47 grand in 89. That was real money. I think you could buy a house for that then. Uh, it's got the original little uh, cleaning cassette thing for uh, the tape deck. It's got the Jaguar. Oh boy, we got the phone ringing. Here we go wireless color. Trying to do this one-handed, it's a pain in the room. 
I'll get there eventually. Anyway, in here, oh, good lord. There it is, is the Jaguar XJS, the total driving experience. I haven't listened to this thing, but I guarantee you there's going to be British accents on it. Uh, we got a radio code book, a uh, handbook. Uh, this is nice. This is basically almost every service record that ever came with the car since new. Lovely stuff. Uh, going back to Denver, forward, forward from there, uh, all into the modern era. So very nice to have all that stuff with the car. You don't often see that. All right, so let's see if we can hop in and go. I got this great little uh, remote here. Give this a try. Look at that. You get to see the innards of Audi Europa now. Well, we've just moved actually, moved about three days ago to this place. I quite like it, but we're still getting everything organized. Anyway, to fire it up down here. And again, just nothing comes to life the way that V12 does. It's got its own unique quality. Uh, really quiet at startup, really silky smooth. Very interesting shifter mechanism. Looks like it came out of a 68 model. And away we go. We got a little bit of sun. Hopefully we get some clouds. Anyway, you see just 38,000 miles on the clock of this car. Dash is perfect. Wood is exceptional. Uh, we've got the ski slope down here, they call it, by virtue of the way the center console is. Let's see if we can make this turn. This is all new, so I haven't done this before. I don't even really feel sarcastic today. We'll get there, don't worry. Uh, look at that original radio, all those great big clunky switches, just absolutely fantastic. And off we go. So 262-ish horsepower out of this thing. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it was for a car in these days. Uh, the V12 was uh, completely unique to the world. Without getting into Ferrari, Porsche, that kind of thing. It was a very quick car, 0 to 60 in under 7 seconds. Uh, top speed around 150. I'm going to have a path. Maybe we're all industrial now. Let's see if I can get out this way. You know, it's a really unbelievable difference, the V12. You've got um, this sort of really long, drawn-out torque curve, and it's so smooth, you don't really know you're accelerating as hard as you are until you look down and go, oh my god, I'm flying. So it just pulls really hard all the way to, uh, you know, whatever uh, speed you're trying to get to. And there's just nothing else like it. That big long hood, uh, the rear visibility, you know, initially the Germans were really concerned that uh, visibility would suck so bad in this thing they couldn't have them in the country. You had to get special permission for every uh, Jag uh, XJS you wanted in there. But they soon figured out the rear visibility was fine. They got into Germany and everyone was happy. Let's get a little AC going. And the AC is nice and cold. Uh, I've had a few guys drive this car just because, you know, they look at it, they say, oh my God, a Jaguar. And I say, okay, get in it. Get in it and drive this one. I guarantee you it's going to be the best example you ever did. And uh, they had to agree. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a really strange, unique thing. It's like a nice vintage V12 XJS. This is just not something you see very often. So many of these cars are all beat to hell. Uh, this one has had just two owners. It's been babied. It's been loved on. It's been mechanically maintained. And uh, man, does it drive like a champ. So uh, there it is. 1989 Jaguar XJS Coupe. High efficiency V12. Uh, very, very collectible car in the sense that it's becoming more and more collectible. And they say if you're going to buy one of these things, start with the finest example you can come by. Uh, you know, one that's not rusty, one that runs nice and proper, one that has documents and service history. And this car has all of those things. Uh, the miles in this car at uh, 38,000 are very, very real. So uh, anyway, there it is. 89 Jag XJS Coupe. Beautiful uh, red color outside. Lovely Connolly. 
uh, you know, beige uh, leather interior. Just a fantastic piece all around. If you have an interest, give us a call, 239-298-8000, uh, on the web at www.aenaples.com. Uh, always happy to talk to you about this or anything else we have in stock. So thanks for having a look. We appreciate it. We'll be fine-tuning this process and getting better, and we'll see you with the next one. Take care.